Good morning. Good morning. We come today to worship together, to be together, here in this hall and across time and space. Welcome. I'm Joyce Palmer, the assistant minister here, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Our worship team this morning also includes Tim Anderson, director of music, worship associate Teresa Wilmot, and Autumn Powell, office manager, is running tech for us today. If you are online, hello. Do like, comment, and share this worship service and engage with each other in the replies or comments. If you are in person, hello again. Masks are welcome, but optional throughout the church, except when singing. Do please put your mask on to sing. Do join us in Deal Hall for coffee hour after the service. The noise of children is always welcome here but please do silence your electronic devices. If today is your first day worshiping with us, online or in person, we are very glad that you are here. Let us know who you are so that we can be in touch. I'll ring the bell and we'll begin worship together. Join me in singing our opening hymn, My Life Flows On in Endless Song, number 108. Please rise in body or spirit.
I'm Teresa Wilmot, your worship associate today. My pronouns are she, her, hers. We gather today for worship here in the homeland of the indigenous Ho-Chunk people. We acknowledge the injustice of the theft of this land by the settler colonial state and acknowledge that our community includes descendants of both those whose land was taken and those who took it, as well as those whose ancestors or you yourself arrived after that theft began. We are invited to learn this true history to form more just relations, and we seek to move toward justice and repair. We are humbled to be on this sacred ground. We gather today for worship, and as we gather, we join in our sacred ritual. The flaming chalice is the symbol of our faith, a beacon of truth, a fire for justice, a warmth for the soul. One of our children um, will light our chalice today. Pardon? Victoria. Let us speak together the covenant of our church. Love is the spirit of this church, and reason is its guide. To dwell together in peace, to seek truth in freedom, and to serve human need. This is our covenant. Now let's sing together our chalice response song. So for our stewardship moment this morning, I'd like to invite Linda Johnson, member of the generosity team, to come forward. Good morning. Can you hear me? Good morning. Good. Well, I came here today to whip up a little feeling of generosity <laughs> and some excitement for that wonderful event being held April 1st, Come and Be Fed. We want all of you to participate. So if there's anything I can do to encourage that, I'm here today to make that happen. As has been shared this past month, we need to ask all of you to consider increasing your financial commitment to our church. We've heard some very moving, heartfelt testimonials from a few members as they shared what belonging to our church family means to them. All of us are here for our own personal reasons to come and be fed by the message, by the music, by the justice work, the relationships we have all formed here. And just like the food that I buy to feed me physically, the cost of being spiritually fed has increased too. So we ask you to consider increasing your commitment by as much as 5%, knowing that all of you will need to consider in your heart what you can afford and what you feel is um, appropriate for you. I had to look up the definition of stewardship as an educator for many, many, many years, and it says the following, the careful and responsible care of something entrusted to one's care. And I think we all feel that our congregation, our family, and our church has been entrusted to all of us as we come, as often as we can, to participate in what we need to be fed. Now I'd like to provide you with some details about that potluck we're going to have on April 1st at 5 p.m. So the doors will open at 5. There will be a short stewardship meeting here at 5.45, very brief, and then at 6, 
we will all gather into Deal Hall to take part in the potluck. But this is no ordinary potluck. We are going to have some competition in this potluck. I want to mention that we will have a cash bar. We think we're having a movie for all the kids. It will be unsupervised. And we definitely want to make it a family event. So to make it interesting, we are going to award prizes in five potluck categories. They will be shared with you again a little bit later. Make note, we want you to bring your best cream of anything. <laughs> we would like you to bring your best vegetarian or vegan, your best spicy, your best dessert bars, and what you consider to be your most comforting food. This is a competition, so all of you, get your cookbooks out. And I bet your best are things that you don't even have to look at a cookbook for. You make them all the time because your family also considers them to be your best. So we will have tickets. People that are here participating will get to vote on what their favorite is in each of those categories. And then prizes will be awarded to those people who win in each of those five categories. Now, if you've ever been to our chili cook-off, you know that we have someone in this congregation, more than one. I could name a few. <laughs> but today, I'm going to ask one of our most competitive members and his wife to come forward to get you inspired to get out there and beat that Spitty Tata at this event. <laughs> Spitty and Shiraz Tata. So now, what did you rope me into? <laughs> It involves food, and I know you like to eat. That makes it somewhat palatable. Get the pun? Palatable food? <laughs> Boy, there's another dad joke, as Raya would say. <laughs> oh, I think I know what this is all about. Can you tell, tell me again? I was kind of listening to Linda, but not exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the club, Linda. But, um, well, it's about the stewardship event that's happening at the church next Saturday. You know those international potlucks you used to have at your house when you were a bachelor? Uh, but this one's here, uh, and everyone's invited to bring a dish that they would like, and Linda said there'd be categories of food, too. Oh, cool. I mean, hot. <laughs> Just like our international potlucks, except this time, it'll be the UUs. They can really cook up a storm, and it's delicious. Of course, you can bring anything. I'll be happy to taste it, and I'll put a category on it for you if you'd like. I might get creative. See, I told you you'd like it. By the way, it's on April 1st, April Fool's Day, you know. April Fool's Day? Are you making this all up? I guess I would have thought that had Linda not already spoken. We, you, you sure know how to choose those dates, don't we? Uh, did Linda say something about competition, too? I like those. Remember that time when I won the chili, chili cook-off? <laughs> that was good chili. And I even introduced Jason Peckles to vinegar in the chili. Yes, I remember that chili cook-off when you won the best of show, because you were the only one who knew there was a best of show or BS prize. Shh. That was quite a BS competition. Shh, no one's supposed to know that. <laughs> anyway, this time it's different. Everyone knows there's a competition. Right? Everyone knows there's a competition. And I think Linda said there would be prizes in each category. More chances for me, oh, I mean us, honey, to win. You're only supposed to bring a dish in one category. Knowing you, you'd like to bring a few, and I will do the cooking. And uh, maybe, but maybe this is a chance for us to cook together, and we can't even kill each other because it's for a good cause. <laughs> 
cooking together, that doesn't work. But I will wash the dishes, I promise. The GE dishwasher and I are quite a team. <laughs> okay, to get serious, let's feed the church the best we can. And I have Victoria who helped me this morning decorate the signs, so Victoria's gonna hold up the categories again. We wanna, yes, cover all, you know, we're all different learners. Some of us auditory, some of us need the visuals. So, um, you know, in the spirit of inclusivity, we have all these categories, and we're not gonna hold you to this, but you know how I like interacting with people. That's part of what brings me to this church. So maybe do a raise of hands if you're thinking of best cream of whatever. No, best, oh, a few hands come down for that one. Okay, best vegan or vegetarian. All right, see a couple of those. And then we've got best spicy. Don't miss Victoria's turkey over there. Best spicy, spritty? Oh, okay. Maybe. All right. All right. Best bars? Who makes good dessert bars? Oh, quite a few hands going up for that. Mm -hmm. And the last one is most comforting. <laughs> All right. I think we're going to have quite a bit of good food. So we look forward to seeing you then. All right, just like we've done, right? We've repeated it time and time again, so it should have sunk in by now. We all know what we're doing. April 1st, it's April Fool's Day. It's not a joke. There we go. All right, on a more serious note, just like Linda said, think about how the church feeds you and your family. That might inspire you to up your pledge to the church. You know inflation is hurting us all, so we're hoping we can get a good bump overall. And if you can afford more, please do so uh, as much as you can. All right. I, I have to get the last word in, right? So thank you, Victoria. <laughs> Thank you, Spitty, and, uh, and everyone, thank you so much, Shiraz. Yes, thank you so much. So what we're gonna do is, um, during the offer, I'm gonna pass clipboards around where you can sign up your name, phone, and what you're thinking of bringing. So we can have an idea of setup. And so we'd just like you to fill it out on the little clipboard that'll come around during offering, please. So let us now prepare ourselves for our call to worship. We're using the words by Dr. David Breeden. When it feels like lament, when lament is the only sound and need, the only way of being, here is that one warm room where you know you belong. You know is waiting, open, ready. Here is that place you remember where you are remembered in this too cold world. This place calls now softly, come. Come into the circle where you know that you belong. Come, let us worship together. Our story today is entitled, What Does It Mean to Be Present? What does it mean to be present? Does it mean showing up to class? No. Does it mean sharing something at show and tell? No. Does it mean wrapping yourself up? No. Being present means listening carefully when other people are speaking. Noticing when someone needs help and taking the time to give them help when they need it. 
focusing on what's happening now instead of thinking about what's next. Appreciating what you have, even if what someone else has, seems better. Waiting patiently for your turn. Treating each new experience as an opportunity and understanding that making mistakes is how we learn and grow. Being grateful for your family and friends and telling them so. Savoring each bite of your delicious food. Cuddling your puppy and enjoying how soft and wriggly he feels relishing the warmth of the sun and the sound of the rain. Feeling the sand between your toes, watching the rolling waves, smelling the briny seaweed, listening to the cawing seagulls, and tasting the ocean's salty spray. Allowing the rhythm of your breath in and out in and out to make you feel peaceful. Closing your eyes and being still enough to hear your inner voice. Being present means living in the moment. It means realizing that yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, and today is a gift. That's why we call it the present. So tell your friends what it means to be present and spread the word. When we're all present, life can be much richer, fuller, and happier. Let us sing our children and youth on to their classes with this little light of mine. I hope you are subscribed to the Kairos, our weekly newsletter. Be sure to read it for announcements about upcoming events and activities. This week, I want to highlight our Seder. Our congregation celebrates its annual Passover Seder this year on April 7th, Good Friday. This is a child-friendly celebration. No need to hire a babysitter. In fact, children are necessary to the ritual. Please join us for the celebration of freedom, which includes a five-course meal. We need reservations in order to buy the special kosher foods. Please record your reservation with Teresa Wilmot, our worship associate today, after the service in the Narthex or the social hall. If you are online, please send an email to Autumn using the format printed in the Kairos. I also want to make a special announcement about next week. We have a special congregational service. We are meeting to vote on approval of the contract to change our office doors from a keypad system to a key card system. There is more information in the Kairos or see Dave Schubert or a member of the Building and Grounds Committee for more information. This Friday, March 31st, is the Trans Day of Visibility. Join us for a march for trans lives on Friday, March 5th, March at 5 p.m., this Friday at 5 p.m. Folks are meeting at the new Liam Foundation building on Fifth Avenue and marching to the office for the community gathering to listen to speakers. Your support is greatly appreciated. We now take up an offering to support the work of justice and mercy in the world. 80% of what's collected today will go to Habitat for Humanity, the Rockford area, which is part of a global nonprofit housing organization. Thank you for your generosity. The offering will now be given and most gratefully received.
from Teresa Wilmot. I like to think I'm open to people and experiences today, but I haven't always been like that. One advantage of being 74 years old is that I've had the opportunity to grow, mature, and become more vulnerable. Not that every person uses this opportunity. When I married at 19, I was lonely, walking to junior college and living with my mother. I fell in love with the first man who showed interest in me. I had learned from my mother that marriage was till death do us part, which was only a few years in her case. When I didn't live happily ever after, I thought it was my fault. I endured that relationship for almost 10 years. After the divorce, I was even more lonely and depressed. I shrank into my cell, shell. Frank Dyka and I met about three years after the divorce. That story involved a broken down Honda Civic and a BMW motorcycle. Maybe because Frank was 19 years older than me, we had a good relationship. I knew Frank was married. Every Saturday, he spent the morning with me and left to spend the afternoon with his wife, checking off her honeydew list. They had been separated for several years. But after a while, I became suspicious. One Saturday morning as we sipped coffee in the kitchen, I asked him point blank, are you living with another woman? He paused, startled. Then he told me the truth. Yes, he'd been living with another woman since he left his wife. I was faced with a dilemma. I could do what my mother would have done and end the relationship or I could continue to enjoy his company. I told him I needed to think about this decision. Looking into myself, I realized I was happy for the first time in many years. If I were to end the relationship, I'd be back to being lonely and depressed. It wasn't a difficult decision after all. We stayed together for 39 years until Frank's death in 2020. Frank wasn't perfect, but he was what I needed. We never married because I didn't want the baggage that came with marriage. I became more open, more vulnerable over the years. We raised our daughter, Erin, who is a UU minister today. After Frank's death, I mourned, I'm still mourning. But I was open to a new relationship, too. I'm not lonely. I have my memories of Frank, but I also have my friends, most of whom are members of this church. The more vulnerable I became, the easier it was to be open to others. Please rise and body your spirit for our hymn, Amazing Grace.
So I have two readings for us this morning, and then our, got a lot of things up here today. Our first reading is a retelling of the Euripides story Hecuba, as told by Martha Nussbaum. I wake up at night thinking about Euripides' Hecuba, a story that says so much about it, what it means to be human, to be a human being in the middle of a world of unreliable things and people. Hecuba is a great queen who has lost her husband, most of her children, and her political power in the Trojan War. She's been made a slave, but she remains absolutely firm morally, and she even says she believes that good character is stable in adversity and can't be shaken. But then her one deepest hope is pulled away from her. She had left her youngest child with her best friend, who was supposed to watch over him and his money, and then bring him back when the war was over. When she gets to the shore of Thrace, she sees a naked body washed up on the beach. It's been so badly eaten by the fish that at first she doesn't recognize it. She looks at it more closely and then sees it's the body of her child and that the friend has murdered the child for his money and just flung the body heedlessly into the waves. All of a sudden, the roots of her moral life are undone. She looks around and says, everything that I see is untrustworthy. If this deepest and best friend proves untrustworthy, then it seems to her that nothing can be trusted, and she has to turn her life into solitary revenge. We see her in the play by putting out the eyes of her former best friend, and it's predicted that she will turn into a dog. This story of metamorphosis from a human to something less than human has really taken place before our very eyes in the fact that she's become totally unable to form a relationship of trust with anything outside herself. Now this comes about not because she's a bad person, but in a sense because she's a good person, because she has had deep friendships on which she staked her moral life. So what this play says that's so disturbing is that a condition of being good is that it should always be possible for you to be morally destroyed by something that you couldn't prevent. To be a, a good human being is to have a kind of openness to the world, an ability to trust uncertain things beyond your own control that can lead you to be shattered in very extreme circumstances for which you were not to blame. And our second reading comes from the book, You Are Your Best Thing and it's from an essay by Jessica Williams. Her essay is entitled, Black Surrender Within the Ivory Tower. As I healed and redefined, I also learned to how to cultivate new communities and environments that allowed me to be seen and heard for who I was, and not just who someone needed me to be. I took a class called the Tao of Healing, and in it, we got to interview a group of survivalists. You know, the people who habitually prepare for the end of the world? They spoke about how they planned, what they anticipated, and why they felt it important to be mindful of the myriad outcomes of the future. I can't remember who asked the question, but from the class came an inquiry that shifted the way I considered not only the unknown, but also working through spaces from a place of vulnerability and uncertainty. So the question is, as a survivalist, someone who is always preparing for the end of the world and training in how to survive unexpected outcomes, what do you need? Is it a tool? Is it water? Is it the perfect shelter? What would be the one thing, if you could think of it, that someone needs to survive the unknown? The survivalist barely hesitated before asserting, quite frankly, the thing you cannot do without is people you can trust. I cling to this wisdom more tightly than ever as I watch the world grow more and more uncertain. With nothing but unprecedented times ahead, I think to myself, I could lose everything all over again, my job, my home, people I love, none of it is promised, and all of it feels particularly temporary right now. Yet because of the mirrors, the people around me who constantly work to remind me not only of who I am, 
but that I am this sacred, reverent being, I have found myself resilient in the face of resistance. Please join me in reading responsively, Give Us the Spirit of a Child, number 664, in the back of our hymnal. I will begin and ask that you read the italicized underlined portion. Give us the spirit of the child. Give us the child who lives within. The child who receives without reservation, the child who gives without judgment. Give us a child's ears that we may hear the music of mythical times. Give us a child's heart that we may be filled with wonder and delight. Give us a child's faith that we may be cured of our cynicism. Let us now prepare for a time of prayer and meditation. I begin this time with an announcement about a death among us. Doris Hibner died unexpectedly a few days ago. Larry is doing okay and has family with him now. The memorial service is planned for Saturday, April 1st at 11 a.m. Let us hold Larry and the family in our thoughts and prayers. Let's now take a deep and cleansing breath and relax into this time of prayer. Our words of centering were written by Tanya Katrin. God, teach us to consider also how others experience the world, to understand how my reality and their reality are different, and yet they share qualities of the same core desire. Teach us to listen for shared feelings, for places of connection. Teach us to be curious and open to hearing differences. Teach us to love into brokenness to give space for, to be patient with, healing. Let us be strong in our vulnerability, in our not knowing, in exposing our less than perfect, scary bits to those in front of us. Give us courage to face judgment, scorn, and hatred because of the greater good. Let us be disciples of essential goodness, strong in our knowing that in each being there is divine light. Give us the strength, O oh God, to keep feeling empathy even when we are tired and broken. For it is then that you are feeling the empty empathy through us. Let us sit together in a moment of silent contemplation. Blessed be and amen.
Thank you. So when we as a staff discuss this month's theme, vulnerability, Reverend Matthew knew right away that he wanted to talk about Schleiermacher and absolute dependence, and he did a beautiful job of that a few weeks ago. I knew I wanted to talk about what comes before dependence. For me, it's trust. How can we be vulnerable if we don't trust? How can we resolve and be into absolute dependence if we don't understand trust? So one way to define vulnerability is our willingness to take risks and expose ourselves emotionally to others. Even the word expose in that definition gives me the cringes. It makes me uncomfortable. I distinctly remember a conversation I had a few years ago. I was working as a library assistant at the Coca-Cola headquarters in Atlanta. Coke had three libraries at this headquarters, a business library, a science one, and a marketing. And I would ro rotate through all of them throughout the day. In the marketing library, I was standing in the librarian's office, and we were just chatting about the events of the day. And there were a lot of news stories at the time about high-profile men who were cheating on their wives and their marriage. And some of the wives would share they were devastated by the news. I, in my youth, said something I'm not sure I agree with any longer, but I said, I don't do devastated. It's not in my vocabulary. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't do it. I had bought into the strong black woman stereotype, which teaches be able at all times to take care of yourself and do not let anyone get close enough to hurt you. My mother would regularly say to me before I left the house, don't let anyone bother you. I was like, what do you mean? But I got it, don't let anyone bother you. This, I believe, would keep me alive, safe, and well. Like the tragic heroine Hecuba, I did not see the road back from devastation. I don't do devastated. Over time, I discovered if I wanted to live a life of meaning and purpose, I needed to care about things deeply enough that it would be possible that tragedy could happen, will happen to me. If we hold our commitments lightly in such a way that we can always divest ourselves of our commitments when they come into conflict, then it doesn't hurt when things go badly. And the result is we are living a less committed and good life. For example, the parent who has a high stakes meeting at work at the same time as their child's first acting role in the school play. The parent knows they cannot be at two places at the same time and that both things are important. The parent is committed to both their work and their child. A choice has to be made, one that may hurt their work life or one that may hurt their child. Having to make a choice does not diminish the parent's commitment to both. So if we want people to live their lives with a deep, serious commitment, not to adjust their desires to the ways of the world, but rather to try to wring from the world the good life they desire, we have to be open and have a, the possibility of that leading to tragedy. I'm not speaking about the dramatic tragedies in Greek plays. I mean the everyday tra tragedies of trying to find enough hours in the day to do all the things that we're committed to doing. The answer for some people is to disengage, to live only for themselves, not trusting the world, not participating in the process of building a better society. This wall that some people build is in response to the hurt and discrimination they have experienced. In the world we live in, there is a need for people who look like me to wear a mask and assume a defensive stance. We never know when the enemies of racism, patriarchy, or misogyny are going to rear their ugly head, so we must stay ready. This is not only a me thing. Lots of people resist being vulnerable. It can be our ideas of manhood, early childhood trauma, past hurts and fears, societal messages that warn us to be strong and define vulnerability as weakness. For some of us, the truth is, we don't know how to be vulnerable because we didn't have models to show us the way. 
Our willingness to be vulnerable and tolerate intimacy matters much more than we think. It is exhausting to wear the mask. There are consequences to our health, mental, physical, spiritual, and to our relationships. A few years ago, social worker and researcher Brene Brown conducted thousands of interviews in search of an answer to the question, what are the elements of a wholehearted good life? She concluded that connection and belonging were the foundations of a good life. Next, she concluded that the key to developing connection is vulnerability. And when she found this to be the case, she was so angry. Because like me, she didn't do devastated. But there it was. The truth is, without connection, there is no intimacy, there is no good life. So her quote is, there can be no intimacy, emotional intimacy, spiritual intimacy, physical intimacy without vulnerability. She goes on to say, one of the reasons there is such an intimacy de deficit today is because we don't know how to be vulnerable. It's about being honest about how you feel, about your fears, about what we need, and asking for what we need. Vulnerability is the glue that holds intimate relationships together. It reminds me of something I once read a counselor tell her client. She said to the client, you were not made to be private. You were made to connect. Ooh, that one hit me too. Privacy is a dodge for vulnerability. I'm just private. I'm just an introvert. Whatever. But no, it, there's a, there are people we can be intimate with. We have to find our people. Friends, family, close associates. Showing up as the real you with the people you care about. Being willing to be seen. Knowing when to take the mask off and to lay it down. Vulnerability's key features are uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. When Brene Brown, the researcher, asked military veterans if these key features, uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure, show up in their experience as soldiers, did the features relate to courage? They thought about it for a moment and responded, yes, ma'am. It was evident in their experience, in their experience in, in action. She asked a group of athletes the same question. Does uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure show up to you as teammates? They huddled together and came back with a resounding yes. The conditions of vulnerability are with us everywhere. Parenting, starting a new business, committing to a partner, engaging in small groups like our Soul Matters groups, recognizing these elements and learning to trust and connect with ourselves and one another frees us to create a good life. We are being, being brave with our lives when we show up as ourselves, when we cannot control the outcome, when we surrender to the reality of uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. Now the benefits of trusting others enough to be vulnerable is valuable for developing intimacy. It's better for our health, it builds empathy and understanding, it opens us to growth and allows us to work well with others. But how do we move towards vulnerability? We can start by paying attention to our feelings. Practice being vulnerable by sharing with someone you trust. Take a step outside of your comfort zone. When you notice someone being vulnerable with you, practice sharing back. Practice being with yourself and others. Practice patience when you don't get, when things don't work out the way you want them to. Value your own experiences and emotions. If practicing vulnerability is new for you, as it is for me, it's okay to start slowly. Be aware of the possibilities of experiencing the vulnerability hangover. Now this is another co a term coined by Brene Brown, one I experience all too often. So you're at an event, you share something, it's appropriate, but later you're like, oh, what did I say that? Is it okay? Oh my gosh. Um, and you start to feel that shame and that fear and the anxiety because you've been honest about your emotions with people. It can make you feel nervous, questioning your self-disclosure. Did I say too much? Will I be understood? Does any of this make sense? Will I be judged or rejected? 
the vulnerability hangover can increase your heart rate, make you feel shaky, sweaty, and nauseous. It is a real thing. But if you experience this vulnerability hangover, find a safe place to relax. Or for me, take a walk, distract yourself for some time, and then take some time to identify your emotions and then embrace the experience as growth. So this is the first part of vulnerability, the personal side, the practice, what we do together. In this next part of my remarks, I want to examine how our vulnerabilities can inform our public life. The thread between our personal experiences of being vulnerable and public life is this. If the good life for us as individuals depends on developing connections created through vulnerability, the goal of politics is to create conditions where each of us can thrive and have a good life. Then our vulnerabilities can and should be part of our public discourse. The Greek tragedies provide a look at the complexity of creating a good life in the midst of all, things, all the things that life can throw at you. In our reading this morning, Hecuba had a good life prior to the war. She was a queen with a family, fortune, and good friends. When circumstances not under her control dramatically changed her life, she remained hopeful that her youngest son would be safe and return due to her trusted friend. Hecuba was experiencing the core ingredients of vulnerability, uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. To live the good life, according to Greek philosophers, requires support of loving parents, society, and education. Some of what the good life includes is also access to clean food and water and air, the development of our talents. It includes an ability to choose the direction of our life and also the ability to make commitments to make our communities healthier and more inclusive, to participate in social and civic affairs. In short, the good life allows us to be our whole self, that is vulnerability. And so the reality is that the good life can also disappear in an instant. We live in a world where the problems are very complex, multi-layered, and plain old messy. There are times when, in order to deal with all the mess, we reach for simple explanations or solutions, rather than recognize there are times when we value a lot of things at once then all of them are serious and worthwhile. This past week, I attended my first meeting with the Lyman Rockford's Ready to Learn team. The focus of the team is on early childhood, supporting families and children to create healthy children who enter school ready to learn. The opening question we were asked to answer was, what is one thing you would do to improve the lives of families with young children? I'm going to ask you to talk to your neighbors right now and answer that question. What is one thing that you would do to improve the lives of the families with young children? So take a few moments, turn to the people around you, and answer that question. What would you do? One thing. Okay, back together. Now shout out some of the things that you answered, some of the things you said. Where were some of the things? Yes, free, accessible child care. Say what? Paid parental leave, yes. Other things. Ah, yes. No homework. Oh! Universal basic Medical care, yes. Yes, yes. Kid free vacations. Say what here? Okay, so enough child care that all of them can go to school, right? These are all great ideas. So we went around the circle with this meeting and everybody's idea was like, oh, I could have said that. Oh, I could have said that. So by the time it got to me, mine was, I would love for every family to make enough money where they're not anxious about how to make ends meet, right? So. The, the reality is that we are a small team in a mid-sized city with a limited capacity and resources to do one or two things well. We can't follow a path of all of these great ideas at once, and that is painful. There's a great possibility that even in our best efforts, needs will continue to go unmet. For example, 
the parent who works, works a shift that goes beyond 6 p.m., the closing time of the ch child care center, what are they going to do? Embracing the complexity of the problem can lead us to ask, how can our institutions make it less likely that these conflicts occur? Can we create a world where child care is more flexible and available when parents need it? It's high quality and it's affordable. That is a vulnerability meeting a public policy. So the Greek viewed life of humans as a plant. This is why I brought this decoration today. So according to the classical philosopher Nussbaum, they have an image of a person like a plant, something that is fairly sturdy, that has definite structure, but that is always in need of support from the sur sur um, surrounding society. The political leader in that image is like the gardener who has to tend the plant. The role of politics is to provide conditions of support for all of the immensely diverse elements in living a full human life. We need leaders to think deeply and well about developing policy and practices to allow people to live their full lives. Lives where people are free to develop and nurture their capabilities, express their emotions, take risks, and live boldly. This will require our leaders to approach their work in a way that is similar to improv. A good improviser has studied the craft draws from their past experiences and emotions, and uses this to connect and interact with human beings and human situations right before them, in the moment. We bring all this together in our thinking and decision making when we see the full humanity of the people standing before us and tune into their story and their experiences. If we do this, it's much harder to maintain the discrimination and fear that we have of one another it is harder for us to dismiss their concerns and needs and more likely that we will collaborate to reach a solution. But what happens now is our leaders and politicians and many of us are unwilling to accurately describe what is going on in the world, unwilling to delve into the complexity of human situations, unwilling to share our emotional responses to situations and conditions that we care about, not just our thoughts, but our feelings. What we need are good storytellers who bring to life what it's like to live as that person and do it in a way that makes all of us see and feel that person's point of view. For example, the child who doesn't think they need an education, but whose life is being boxed in by their lack of awareness about their possibilities. Or the trans youth who is unable to share their identity with their parents due to fear of becoming homeless or the senior who fears aging and dying alone because their family and fear, friends live far away. We need to understand what it's like to be that person so that together we can answer, how do we promote development and well-being for this person? We all need to honestly reflect and express how we feel about the problems in society. The vulnerable expression of our opinions in public meetings and forums would allow us to imagine together how to achieve the good life and create a vision of what it takes to support the flourishing of all of us so that we can all truly be free. Let us rise and body our hymn for our closing hymn, I Wish I Knew How.
Teresa will extinguish our chalice, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry with us until we are together to again. While she does that, I invite you to join hands with one another if you'd like. If you'd rather not be touched, that's okay. Please put your hands in your pocket or on your shoulders or over your heart. The words of our benediction are from Paul Robeson. Sorrow will one day turn to joy. All that breaks the heart and oppresses the soul will one day give place to peace and understanding, and everyone will be free. Let us now sing the words of our benediction.